Welcome to Animals Today, your home for series talk about animals. I'm Dr. Lori Kirshner. Peter, why don't you tell us about what probably is the biggest animal story of the week? Yeah, I think so. And that is the first pig to human heart transplant. Yep. Everyone's talking about that. This is a culmination of decades of medical research. And here's a couple of the highlights you may be familiar with. The recipient, his name is David Bennett. He is 57. This happened at the University of Maryland. And essentially a heart from a pig that has been uh, highly genetically modified over many years of research was uh, transplanted into this recipient who had end-stage heart disease, obviously. And he is still alive after more than a week, right? So how did this uh, come to pass and uh, where do we go from here? Those are the sort of questions people are asking, the ethics surrounding this. And I wanted to just give you a couple more uh, details. The company that produced this heart and the pigs that uh, they are derived from is called Revivacor. And this company has been working on this for a couple of decades, like I mentioned. And thanks to CRISPR genome editing technology, which is truly a miraculous thing, they have been able to make the hearts less susceptible to being rejected by the human immune system by taking out some genes that the pig naturally has and inserting some human genes into the heart so that it doesn't get uh, rejected. And that is really, as far as medical stuff goes, that's quite an achievement. Consequently, this might be the next wave of medical treatment. It's very, very expensive and uh, it's certainly experimental. This particular case came down to emergency authorization from the FDA. They really wanted the hospital to do like 10 cases where the heart was transplanted into baboons, which is his own issue. But this gentleman appeared and they made a special request and he needed it because he was not eligible to have a conventional human heart transplant. More on that in a second. Anyway, it happened, and it's called a xenotransplant from uh, across species from an animal to a human. And everyone is uh, talking about it, the bioethicists, the medical ethicists, the animal welfare folks, the surgeons. Everyone's uh, very interested in this and uh, developing their uh, opinions. So a couple of things to consider. One, of course, is the cruelty to the animals involved, both in the research and the ones that are ultimately going to be sacrificed. You can imagine a time in the future where farms of Frankenstein animals are created just to create organs for people, and that's not very nice, right? So big ethical concerns about that that we have too. Second is the risks to the world as far as introducing viruses and pathogens uh, that originally are harbored in animals and now are possibly ending up in people to be transmitted. We all are worried and concerned about zoonotic or zoonotic infections now. And so is this going to be a whole new way of that happening? Nobody really knows. And who do you trust anyway? This particular recipient, right? A lot of people are talking about him. He is no Boy Scout. He actually is a convicted felon, spent years in prison for uh, attacking and harming someone with a knife. Details uh, not clear. The person ultimately died years later, and uh, he served his time, and then he's out in society. But uh, is he the finest or the best person to receive this special heart and save his life? A lot of people don't want to touch that. The hospital and the medical ethicists, their perspective on that is that, oh, we only look at the medical records and the history of the individual is not important to us. We don't even care. We only see illness and we want to treat it. And this person needed our care, something like that. And my opinion, well, my opinion doesn't matter, but to me, it seems funny at best. Another thing that comes up is is if this is going to be a common future treatment, it's going to suck up so many other resources. This is super expensive. And why not advocate preventive medicine, healthy lifestyles, 
or less expensive treatments that can be given to hundreds of thousands of people, except for the fortunate few at maybe a million or half a million dollars a shot. So allocation of resources, uh, you know, they're not unlimited. And so those are some of the issues that uh, people are uh, are talking about. Oh, and Lurie, and there's one more thing about this recipient, um, Mr. Bennett. He was not eligible for a regular uh, transplant because he was non-compliant. He hadn't taken his medicines properly, and he was just a bad patient. He was a bad candidate, so they didn't want to put him on the regular transplant list. So look where we are. It's just crazy, in my opinion. So that's what's happening. That's what everyone's talking about. Peter, you laid out the story and the elements of the story and the things to think about so well. Thank you so much. It's been reported that the pig heart recipient, this felon, (laughs) is doing well and just passed his two-week post-transplant milestone. Okay. Yeah, and cardiovascularly, he continues to improve. Okay. I do want to talk just a little bit about the ethics of the story. But first, I want to ask you, did you hear about this? The University of Alabama at Birmingham reported that they had, for the first time, successfully transplanted kidneys from a genetically modified pig into the abdomen of a 57-year-old brain-dead man? Yeah, I heard about that. And so that was like preceding this. Yes. That was just, and that was just published. And that is another example of, of using this. And they utilized the body of a person who is brain dead, but being held on life support and to prove the point that you can make this transplant, I guess. So do you think in hospitals currently, they're asking patients, families whose father or mother or loved one is in the hospital and they're cognitively not all there and they're asking if they want to... You mean even before brain dead, just like, ah, (laughs) like a Saturday Night Live, (laughs) the mercy killers. Okay. No... I don't know what kind of protocol they had at this particular hospital, but it's a strange new world. All these things are weird. Okay, let's talk about the ethics of the first heart transplant from a genetically modified pig to this guy. So the term, as you mentioned, xenotransplantation, xenotransplantation refers to organ transplant between species. And of course, there can be an entire discussion related to the ethics of genetic modifications of animals for this purpose, as you laid out. But now... There is this other ethical question, concern, discussion surrounding the recipient of the organ. I read, Peter, that about 3,500 people in the United States are waiting for a heart, and many will wait more than six months. But some will die before a heart becomes available to them. In this case, like you mentioned, the recipient was 57-year-old man David Bennett, and he ended up with heart failure. And was not eligible for a conventional heart transplant. I wasn't sure why, but you you have told us why, which yeah. is very interesting to learn. He was non-compliant with his medications yeah. and not a good patient. Yep. But this guy, Bennett, was convicted of stabbing a man. That man was called Edward Shoemaker and leaving him paralyzed in a wheelchair. Yeah. I have no idea what the criteria are for eligibility for a transplant. I'm sure they're based on medical factors and I have no idea if an ethical process is in place for deciding how to allocate organs once they become available. Mm -hmm. Guidance from the U.S. Organ Transplantation Network says that, quote, status as a prisoner, I know this guy wasn't a prisoner, but status as a prisoner should not preclude someone from consideration for a transplant. Now, applicable to Bennett's case, one can argue that he served his sentence in jail and now he's deserving of the same rights, medical rights, as everyone else, right? Right. This is from the Washington Post. A statement from the sister, I believe, of the victim says, Ed suffered the devastation and the trauma for years and years that my family had to deal with. I wish, in my opinion, it had gone to a deserving recipient. So she's characterizing this guy as not a deserving recipient. More from the Washington Post. More than 106,000 Americans are on the national waiting list for an organ transplant, and 17 people die each day, never receiving the organ they need. In the face of such a shortage, it can seem unconscionable to some families that those convicted of violent crimes would be given a life-saving procedure so many desperately need. Yes. What do you think? I just think it's just bizarre that the hospitals and the medical ethicists and this guy, you know, this celebrity ethicist Arthur Kaplan from NYU. He, you know, that's his take also. He's like, oh, 
we're blind. You know, they really turn a blind eye. Like they're just like, oh, we gonna ignore or just keep us in the dark about everything else. We're just yeah. gonna go on the straight and narrow, and it's just not realistic. I mean, it's just crazy. Right. So this is the basic ethical question here: Give the heart to your law-abiding brother waiting for a heart transplant, and we know they're in short supply, so without one, he'll likely die soon, or a felon, convicted felon, who stabs a man, leaving him paralyzed for the remainder of his life. So essentially, saving this guy's life, the the same guy who took the life of another. Yeah, well. You know, there is a thing called the Hippocratic Oath Mm -hmm. that you and I took, remember? I remember. You know, I remember during my medical training, Peter, one of the nearby county hospitals, we had to treat convicts. Yes. In fact, in one of my clinics, there was a particular day of the week in which we would expect individuals from the nearby jail to be escorted by their guards and they would be in handcuffs. And we were not usually told what they did or why they were incarcerated. But on one occasion, I remember the guards cautioned me and took me aside oh, and said that this person you're about to examine is extremely dangerous and to stay at least four feet away from him. I said, that's going to be a little difficult if I have to examine the guy and make body contact with the guy. Mm. The entire time, my heart is racing, as you can imagine. I'm thinking this guy's probably a psychopathic serial killer, and he could easily wrap his handcuffs around my neck and choke me to death before anyone could stop him. Peter, what do you know about cross-species organ transplantation, and specifically the practice of transplanting organs from pigs to non-human primates like chimps or baboons. Yeah. Not to help primates who are in heart failure, that's for sure. Right. right? Exactly. So, so this is a, a is research, a precursor to what we're seeing now. Right. Instead of experimenting on one animal, you experiment on two. Oh, oh that's the other thing. Um, it involves that's another two, ethical, two animals. Right. That's right? a double, a double ethical. Oh, yeah. But yeah, that's, how, that's their stepping stone. And ultimately, as in this case, they reached... The limits of the knowledge or the limits of what you can understand in the pig baboon interaction. So ultimately, you need to now learn what you can on people if this is where it's going to go. Okay, well, that was quite interesting. Thanks, Peter. Okay, we'll see what, what happens. Hopefully, uh, well, we'll see what happens with this one. You'll give us an update, I'm sure. Yes. Okay, don't go away. More with the show right after the break. 